Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to my shop. Today we're making a drawer bottom plane and this is actually a kit from Red Rose Reproduction. So we're gonna have a lot of fun, let's dive in. Today we're gonna to be making a drawer bottom plane and this is actually a kit from Red Rose Reproductions. I've done a few kits from him in the past and uh, this one is really, really cool. I've wanted to do it for a little while and I finally bit the bullet and uh, purchased one. And uh, we're gonna have a little bit of fun today. A uh, drawer bottom plane is basically a grooving plane. Now I've made many simple wooden grooving planes in the past. I have videos of making them in just a couple hours. Uh, but basically we're gonna be making a quarter inch wide groove, a quarter inch deep, a quarter inch in from the bottom. And you can change those parameters to just about whatever you want, but this one is designed to make a quarter inch wide groove. Now for the body, you usually want something that is quarter sawn, uh, and you want something that is uh, Man, relatively so straight and clean. Hard and dense is key, and I have this piece of epe that will work really, really well for it. Uh, traditionally, the go-to wood is European oh, yeah. beech. Um, in America, it would most commonly uh, be a hard maple. But uh, I have this piece of epe that was brought back to me by Luke, our videographer, and I thought, eh, let's, let's give this a try. And so we need to cut it uh, to be, well, as long as the plans tell you to. And in this case, I am following plans, mostly. I'll make a few modifications here and there. Uh, but the nice thing about this kit is the plans have a full-scale uh, drawing, so you can actually lay things out and, and shape them to precisely what they are. And uh, it makes things really, really easy. So I'm going to cut this to the rough dimensions of the outside. And thankfully, it's already at the right thickness. Well, actually, it ends up being about a 16th inch too thin, but that means I'm just going to make my fence just a little bit thinner. Uh, we'll make it a little bit weaker in the end, but oh well. Now, he generally suggests the first thing you should cut out uh, is the the actual slot that the iron goes into. And this is a little daunting. We're not going to make this laminate. It's going to be out of a solid piece. And so cutting that basically a tapered long mortise for the iron to fit down into is a little more difficult. It is off-centered because there will be a fence on one side of this and we're going to be cutting a bunch of rabbits into this to shape out that fence. So we're going to lay out on the top exactly where it will be and then once we have these marks on the top we can transfer those to one of the faces and with that in set we can actually then lay out how all the angles will be. I decided rather than cutting out the whole thing ahead of time, I'm actually going to cut out the bottom rabbit first. And my initial thought was I'm just going to use a rabbit plane. Uh, and then I thought, yeah, let's try something a little different. And so I don't get to use this all, all, all that often. And I thought, let's, let's give this a try. So this is actually a kerfing plane or a kerfing saw or a rabbiting saw. Uh, it's basically a saw on a rabbit. <laughs> and I can cut in from one side, then rotate it and cut in from the other side. It makes it relatively easy. Um, and it works out really well, but it's more or less a novelty for me now. If you can hit a line with a saw, then there's no real reason for one of these. It's just a little bit fun. Then I can come in and clean it up with a shoulder plane, get rid of the little bit in the corner, and I have a nice little rabbit here. Uh, the edge of this rabbit will actually be the fence that slides along to, to shape it. Uh, if you don't have that, you can come in and get a little bit more, and I found that, eh, I kind of like the chisel. Um, I don't know why I like to freehand things whenever possible. It gives me a little more enjoyment uh, rather than setting things up exactly. Now this calls for a 50 degree angle and so I brought out my, uh, my bevel gauge and then put it at 50 degrees. Now the smart thing would have actually been to set it up against the small metal piece that's brought with because it's very important that it's the exact same angle as that. Um, thankfully my measurements were accurate and therefore it ended up being correct. So a 50 degree bed for this. I'm going to lay out those marks on the bottom and then we're going to have a wedge so the front angle is actually slightly steeper and we can drill in from one end and then drill in from the other and chisel back and forth. Had a little bit of split out there. Uh, it's not going to be as much of a problem because I'm going to be removing that in a little bit. Uh, but on the top I had some split out and that one, eh, that one's a little more of a problem. Down here it's not. So I'm going to be boring at an angle and I'm going to be following very close to the 50 degree line. Then we're going to come in from the other side and I'm going to follow from the 50 degree side on one and then I'm going to follow from the other and just kind of play connect the dots inside this block. And I'm going to try and remove as much of the material as I can with the auger. Now there are um, better ways to do this if you have particular tools and I'm going to be showing a few of those particular tools but I'm also going to be kind of doing it the hard way. How do you do it with just a simple chisel? 
So we once we've bored out most of the material, then we're going to start working out with the, the chisel. And there's going to be a, a wedge in the middle that needs to be removed. And so little bit by little bit, I'm going to be using a, a 3 16 and a quarter inch chisel, um, as well as a half inch chisel, and going back and forth, trying not to take out any more than I need to, um, staying away from the lines. But basically what you're doing is you have a rectangular box at the top, and you have a rectangular box at the bottom, and you're going to play connect the dots from each of the corners. Here I'm actually using an eighth inch float. Uh, this is a plane maker's float, and they make several that have the, the side um, float as well. And I would love to get one of those, but I don't have one in hand, so we're going to be using what we've got. You're you're playing connect the dots. You're just going to be giving yourself a smooth edge. And what I can do is I can put the chisel in there and I can use the side of the chisel as a straight edge and make sure that it is touching the box rectangle on the top as well as the box rectangle on the bottom. And once those touch, uh, then you know where they are. If it's rocking in the middle, you know you need to take out a little material. If you don't have floats, files work out really well, but finding one that's small enough to fit in there is, uh, is sometimes the difficulty. But we're going to keep going until the iron fits in there and I can make it connect from one side to the other. have a little bit more material to remove, but this one is really close. On the top, there's also going to be a rabbit cut into this, and this really isn't necessary. It's more or less for the feel of it. Um, it looks really good if the top is centered on the iron. And so rather than cutting the rest of it, I decided to come in with that. And for this one, I'm just going to be using my tenon saw. Uh, you don't need anything specialty. You don't need a rabbit plane or a rabbit saw to cut in there. Um, it takes a little more work, but I actually kind of like this. That's why if you can saw to a line, then you can remove it. And we're just going to pop out this little piece. And like that, we've got a uh, another rabbit cut into this board. The saw went a little bit askew inside, but that's okay. I was staying a hair off the line so we can come back and clean it up. We also need to cut out another rabbit on the bottom. And this will be a slot uh, for this guide rail to fit into. And this is the actual sole is this metal piece. Um, so we need to cut in another rabbit here. And then we're going to cut in another rabbit. And it's it's a lot of the same here. Um, and to show you, there are other ways to do it. I'm going to do a little bit with this one with the 45. Um, again, if you have a rabbit plane, you could use that. If you have a 45, you could use that. If you have a 55, you could use that. If you have a handsaw, you could use that. There's there's no excuse why you, you yeah, can't cut it. Fun. There are always other tools that you this can you use. Um, but in the end, I actually find that I like using just a saw and freehanding it. Oh, here's a tool you don't see very often. Uh, this is actually a cam that goes on the other side to stabilize it. And you'll make several passes, and then you'll lower the cam down. And what this does is it keeps the plane level, allowing it to register on the other side. Uh, it's just a nice yeah. little device that you don't use very often, but when you do, it's well worth having it. Uh, but I kind of got um, fed up with that, and I'd just rather cut it out. Um, <laughs> why? Because I like to. So I'm going to use my tenon saw to uh, cut down and remove this other rabbit. Then the tricky part comes, we have those metal guides that need to fit into this body, and we actually have to cut a slot down in. But those guides are thinner than an eighth inch and thicker than a sixteenth inch, and so I needed to find a chisel that would fit down in there. Um, and I went back forth with a bunch of different ideas. The, the best would be to have a grooving plane with that really thin little spot. But the thinnest 45 or 55 iron is an eighth inch. So what we're going to do is we're going to lay this on here, and we're actually going to cut two grooves parallel to each other. And putting two grooves that close together is relatively difficult. So it's something you need to have a little bit of skill for. But if you have some patience and practice it, you can do. Then I actually ended up modifying one of my carving chisels to make it slightly thinner so that it would fit down in there. And then these slides, these skates, will fit down into that groove. And so I just need to work it down in a little bit deeper until it'll actually fit down in there. So I'm using the depth measurement on the calipers to make sure that it's the same depth all the way across. Um, I needed to come in with a file and remove a little bit more so it would work down in there. Um, making sure that I get exactly a quarter inch all the way along. So you can see how this skate will fit down into that little groove running right alongside the rabbit. This is probably the most fiddly part of this whole step. Um, and the plans say uh, you can get a table saw, and that's the reason why he makes the skate the thickness it is. is It's a standard table saw thickness plate. So you could just do it with a table saw and, and go to town with that. But uh, I decided to do it the hard way because that's what this channel is all about.
Next thing we need to do is make a wedge, and I could have made it out of something standard like maple, but then I had this beautiful piece of red gum from Australia. This was sent to me by a friend of the channel, and I thought, yeah, the red gum will look really good with the ePay, and uh, I, I, you know, looks are the most important thing. <laughs> so we need to lay out the wedge, and basically what you want to do is cut an angle all the way along, and this angle will end up being much longer than the wedge needs to be. Uh, but the nice thing about this is if you mess up one, then you'll have the other one to work with. And uh, I don't know why, but whenever I make a simple quarter inch thick wedge, I usually end up needing the second half. Not quite sure why, but <laughs> that's the way it works out. So when you cut two, you usually end up with one for some reason. Now, I wish I had planed it all down to thickness at the beginning, but then I was thinking, oh, I'm just going to need this one wedge, so I'm just going to plane this one down to thickness. You put in a little double-sided tape and then let it slide up against the the dog there and make sure it is of the appropriate thickness to then fit into that slot. Just keep going until it's ever so slightly thinner. I want it to have a little bit of space side to side, not a whole lot, but I want it to slide in easily and then lock itself in place. And you can see how that wedge will fit in there. So the next thing we're going to do is do a little more detail on this because at this point we want this to actually be exactly what it needs to be. And so I'm going to come in with my files and floats and chisels and clean it all up, get rid of any bumps, any imperfections, so we have a nice square edge on all sides. And then I put the wedge in and I hit it too hard and too far in. And I couldn't get the stupid wedge to come out no matter what I tried. Um, and I ended up busting it. And so that's where the second wedge comes out. Um, yeah, uh, you live, you learn, and, 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 and then you always have a second wedge ready to go. <laughs> so we hit the second one in place. Thankfully, it's already at the right angle. We just need to trim it up, fit it all in there, and make sure that everything is the way we want to. We can put the iron in, and you can see how the iron has a groove in the back of it to fit into the front of the back skate. We're also going to center out these holes. Um, one of these days, I'd actually like to get a center punch, um, but uh, I, I don't have one of those yet, so we're using what we have. We're going to pre-drill in uh, for these screws to go in and make sure you wax these screws so that they uh, that they slide in. Uh, this one ended up being a little bit too far out and I had to re-drill that hole. Um, if you do have to re-drill a hole, uh, then make sure that uh, you fill it. Um, I ended up making some that wedges out of uh, other ePay and I drove it in and then re-drilled the hole to move it over just a little bit more. Now the other thing we have to do on this is we need to harden the iron. It doesn't come hardened, it just comes shaped. Um, and so I get three propane torches and set them all up to aim at the same spot. And then with some vice grips, yes, you can set them in the middle and there. wiggle them back and forth and get them into place so that this uh, tip is pointing up into it. And so what we're going to be looking for is you'll see that straw and the, the blue coming down. And we're going to keep going until the tip gets cherry red. And at this point, it's no longer magnetic. And that's all you need. And one quick movement, we're going to take it off and plunge it into oil. Um, I'm using boil and suit oil. Yes, I probably should use motor oil or something with a little higher content, but in all honesty, this will work perfectly fine. Um, I don't need this to be the absolute perfect hardness. I just need it to be close to it. It's not a tool that you use all the time, but get it close and, and call it good. Then we can put it in the toaster oven and let it sit for about an hour. And this will uh, bring it down to that slightly softer because when it's freshly hardened, it is way too hard and it can actually break. And that's when you get chipping. So when you actually put it in there and uh, temper it down to what you're looking for, then you'll get the steel you want. At this point, everything else we're going to be doing on the body is aesthetics or making it feel good. And we're putting in some uh, heavy um, light angled chamfers. Um, so they come down uh, a little over a quarter inch, but they only go in about a sixteenth of an inch. And on the top ones, we can run those with a plane, uh, but on the side, they traditionally come down to a uh, stopped chamfer here. And so you can do that with the chisel. I'm going to round over the corners a little bit. Um, some of that I can do with the planes, some of it I'm going to do with the chisel. Um, just looking for any coarse um, shoulder, I want to actually just soften a little bit. Um, particularly that bottom side, um, I was running into a, a few... Um, uh, well, it was it was splintering out because one of the problems with ePay is that the grain um, is interlocking. It goes in both directions, so it doesn't matter which direction you go, you're going to run into it. Now, historically, this corner would actually be rounded, and I like the rounded look, but I actually really like the chamfered look. And so, again, I'm going to deviate a little bit from it and work on putting chamfers in places where they don't aren't supposed to go. 
Oh, well, I like that. <laughs> for the wedge, uh, there's a circle on the end and a notch that helps you pull it out if it gets stuck. Um, and so we're going to just follow the plans and make the same simple design on this. Most of this you can chisel out and shape down. Um, and I was getting really, really close here and I was starting to get right down to the line. I was loving the direction of the grain and this was going really, really well uh, until I decided to round the end right here and the thing just goes... Oh. Well, thankfully, that's why they make glue. <laughs> uh, I probably should have recut it and made a third one, um, but a little bit of glue on here and okay. Um, again, this is a, a plane that I am just having fun with in the shop. Is it going to be a daily user? No. Um, honestly, if I make grooves, I'm probably going to grab the other grooving plane that I make uh, because it just, it, it's just it's there and it's ready. But this one um, is a lot of fun and another project to try. You also need to remove a little bit of material up by the front. Uh, this will just allow the chips to curl out a little bit easier rather than running into things. Um, you're going to make it match the angle on the wedge. Speaking of the angle on the wedge, the tip of the wedge um, actually needs to be wedged the other direction, um, 90 degrees to the main wedge. So with this mostly shaped down, we can get it close to where we need to be and start doing the final details on that. Get it close with a rasp and then come into the file and smooth it down and uh, then you can hit with sandpaper or whatever you want to do. Usually um, the file is going to be the last one I use. Um, a very, very fine file does an amazing job and you can really get a nice clean detail on a file. Um, but yeah, just getting used to good file and a good rasp is, uh, is a fantastic skill because it's amazing what you can get right off of them with those without having to go to sandpaper. And then talking about that angle that needs to be on the tip, uh, so this is at 90 degrees to the other wedge, or it's it's rotated 90 degrees. It's not actually 90 degrees. It's another angle. <laughs> and thankfully, the plans spell that all out, so it makes it fairly simple to follow that. Let's go back to the iron, and we actually need to sharpen this. It comes with the tip down to uh, probably about a 32nd, and so we need to actually grind off a little more material because you don't want it to have a sharp point for the hardening, otherwise it becomes very, very brittle. And so at this point, we're just going to give it that edge we want, hone it up, and the iron is ready to go, and we could possibly pull our first curls off of this. You want to push it into place until it just touches, and uh, oh, oh, those are bunching up. Why are they bunching up? We don't want them to bunch up. We want nice little curly cues like that. And most of the time we're getting these curly cues, but every now and then it catches and it bunches up. Um, and so I just need to actually uh, clean out a little bit. The Every now and then the curl would come up and it would catch the wedge. And so I just cleaned that wedge down a little bit more, and then they let it slide by. And you get these gorgeous little curls that come off every time. Okay, let's come back over to this. The last little details on this. Um, I'm putting in small chamfers on all the corners, feeling it with my hands, seeing where there are issues, seeing where there are problems, and just putting in that last little bit of detail here and there. Um, this is the point at which you can get really fun. I was thinking initially about putting some carving on the side. Uh, I decided not to. Um, why? Because, uh, I don't know, it's a little lazy, but uh, I may put some carving on in the future. We will see. There's two good, clean surfaces for the carving to go on, and uh, it, I, I guess I could in some time in the future. I'm going to hit it with some 400 grit sandpaper. I'm not really sanding it as much as I'm just um, working a little bit of dust into the surface. It'll help the boiled linseed oil soak in a little bit more. And then, of course, because it's a hand tool in my shop, it's getting coated in boiled linseed oil, and I'm going to let that sit and soak up as much as it wants, wipe off the excess, and then apply paste wax. And I love the way that feels. So all the hand tools in my shop are finished with boiled linseed oil and paste wax. And uh, just like that, we've got a finished product. And uh, making your own tools is kind of an interesting thing because they're never going to be quite as good as the ones you can buy and spend a lot of money on. But most of the time they're going to be decently uh, affordable and, and cheaper. But you can modify them and make them exactly what you want. And you can put a lot of love and fun into them. And that's what makes it enjoyable. And this was a very, very fun project. So, yeah. <laughs> Happy Drawer Bottom Plane. There you have it. 
Ipei Body Australian Red Gum. Uh, the Australian Red Gum was actually sent to me by a fan of the channel. The Ipei was actually brought uh, by Luke, our videographer. He was down in Brazil and brought me back a chunk a while ago. So this was a lot of fun to put together. Uh, it's a fairly cool kit. It's a little more advanced. You're gonna have to spend some more time on it and come around things. Um, but it's, it's, it's relatively simple once you actually break it down into the individual steps. I'll leave a link to the kit down below. Um, I did buy it with my own money. This isn't sponsored or anything like that. Um, I just like making toolkits, and this is a really, really good one. If you haven't seen Red Rose Reproductions, he does some amazing tools out there, and I've made a couple things for him in the past, such as the, the spill plane, and uh, yeah, I love what he does, and anytime he puts out a kit, I, I like getting one, so. I did change a few things from the initial plans and the kit. So what things should I have done the same? What things could I have done differently? I'd love to hear those thoughts and ideas. I do learn a lot from that, so thank you. And throwing those down in the comments does help out the channel. It's just as much as hitting like, share, subscribe, commenting, thank you. <laughs> it means more than I can say because it does get us in front of more people and helps the channel grow. So thank you. And there are a whole bunch of people who do put just comment down below. Thank you. <laughs> as well as there are a bunch of names over here. Those are all patrons on Patreon. And without patrons on Patreon, we wouldn't exist. We are completely sponsored by you guys. Um, we don't take on sponsorships. When I use things in the shop, they're things that I have purchased myself. So I hope you like that. It does mean a lot to me that I get to say what I want to say and not what others want to say. And I get to work with what I want to work with rather than what the companies want me to work with. And if you like that, think about becoming a patron or a member. And until next time, have a wonderful day. This thing makes me want to go back to the 1970s because it is seriously groovy.